Today is Sunday, January 22nd, 2023, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Pretty strange winter we're having. Cloudy, we're used to that, but very mild, and I guess we're getting more used to that. You know, when I first moved to Michigan years ago, I remember being fascinated by the ice fishing shanties you would see on the area lakes. Not as many of them anymore, and pretty impossible this year with the warm temperatures. Maybe it's actually doing us a favor, especially if you're inclined to eat what you catch. A new study out this week shows extremely high levels of PFAS in freshwater fish. PFAS are those forever chemicals that have been linked to all kinds of health problems. It is not great news in a state where around a million fishing licenses are sold every year, and especially for those who fish for food to help offset the high price of groceries. We're going to talk about that study this morning. We're also going to talk about an old problem that is sadly seeing a new burst of energy and violence in Detroit, and that's warfare among street gangs. We know about gang fights, but it's a little different now. New gangs and new kinds of lawlessness, including kidnapping. We're going to get a primer on Street Gangs 2023 in just a minute. And a little later on, we're going to talk with Brian Dickerson. He's been a frequent Flashpoint guest over the years, but he's one of quite a few leaving the Detroit Free Press in a round of voluntary layoffs. That phrase doesn't even make sense, but it's even more troubling as a checkup on the state of journalism in the Motor City. It's all this morning on Flashpoint. Well, we talk on our newscast far too often about street violence. We don't always connect it immediately to gangs because often that isn't clear until sometime after that spray of mayhem. But gang violence is rearing its ugly head and it's time to talk about it. From the Detroit Police Department, very happy to have with me this morning Commander uh, Eric Decker. He's with the Organized Crime Unit and Lieutenant LaSalle Rue works on gang intelligence. Men, thanks very much for coming. I, uh, I, it feel, I started reading, Robert Snell wrote a piece recently uh, in the Detroit News about uh, what's going on with gangs. And I'm reading about things like uh, the 1125 gang and kidnappings and weaponry that comes from Russia. And I thought it might be time. Is there something new going on? Officer Decker, is this is something new happening? I don't know if it's new, Devin. It's unfortunately we've had gang activity the 26 and a half years I've been here. Uh, has it changed? It has to an extent. Um, I think one of the newest parts is our approach to gangs over the last several years. Which is what? Which has changed in what way? We have a very um, robust community involvement of gang enforcement. Um, it's really, it's a collective group. The community, the faith base, and not just Detroit police. It's bringing everybody to the table. Our federal partners, Michigan State Police, the local entities all very important, and yet, Officer Rue, it, it, it's hard to keep a, a lid on this stuff. It, it, uh, and innocent people end up getting hurt. Uh, I mean, there really is, it, it often feels random, but it's not. Uh, they know who they're going after. Somebody's being targeted usually in these things. But this is uh, really worrisome for the folks who live in the neighborhoods where something all of a sudden happens like at the gas station down the street. Yeah, in a lot of incidents, uh, you get groups that uh, are together one day, are per se beefing the next day. So it's a little it's an unorthodox format of how they group up and gang up. So you get, you know, one day you're my friend. Next day you're not my friend. And that's the and they are actually perpetrating this violence am amongst each other throughout different neighborhoods. So, you know, they're not so keen on, hey, this is my territory. They're everywhere. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, they're just going around, again, perpetrating these crimes uh, throughout the city with no actual purpose, per se. It, 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 that's, what, that's why it feels like mayhem to a lot of people, unfortunately. The other thing that is different, uh, you were telling me earlier, officer, it used to be, it was always guns and, and drugs. Always. Yeah. For guns and, and, and that's certainly guns the way. Guns Still but, out there. But that's changing a little bit too, right? The way that uh, they uh, find that That, that was the money source of a, a gang, was to sell drugs, make money. Uh, not so much anymore. That we still have doping guns, unfortunately, but we see a lot more fraud these days. So it's, which, it's which the is, new money maker. Uh, which is often a tech crime, right? Absolutely. Uh, 
So they've gotten media, sophisticated, I guess is what I'm saying. If, if the time spent in learning how to be a criminal was spent in other avenues, it would be a lot better. But absolutely. I mean, you're looking, unfortunately, at COVID, the money coming from the state welfare, just everything, learning how to tap into it and make that the new source of income, which unfortunately you're looking at, you know, you talked a little bit about weapons, a lot higher end weapons coming out there. We're seeing automatic weapons. We're seeing Glock switches. And, and those are being fueled by a lot of fraud. Which makes it all the more dangerous for people like you, yeah. right? Yes, yes. I mean, you you get their their focus on, you know, what they call swiping, scamming, you know, you trying to steal credit card numbers, uh, utilize devices that they slide into a, at, at, a, at a gas pump. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, the traditional uh, narcotics nexus to these gangs, again, is do, you know, it's still a still the factor. But now with the, the younger members, per se, they're getting into those uh, computer crimes and knowing how to steal yeah. identities and, and people's financials and using that to fund whatever they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing that Robert Snell's article uh, suggested, I, back in the day when we first started covering gangs, we very seldom saw video of, uh, of, of women being arrested. But that there's more, uh, they seem to be showing up more and more in gang-related crimes or issues. Does that, does that feel right? Or has that always been that way? I think there's always been females involved in it, um, maybe better cooperation again of actually, you know, what has been huge for us for the police is technology, these camera systems yeah. to yeah. actually see it. We might have heard about it, and maybe that's why there wasn't as much prosecution. I mean, the case in there, it had video surveillance. It wasn't hard to show that those females were, they weren't just there. And I think that might have been in the past. I think yeah. it's, I don't know how much it's changed, but... You start looking at video surveillance and go, well, she's not just part of the, the group. She's an active participant yeah. in here. So. The other thing that uh, we, we know that for over the years that has made this really difficult to try to get a handle on is the no snitch culture that gangs kind of uh, help, they, they sort of control a neighborhood, and fear ends up being a huge part of uh, people not wanting to say, to tell people like you what they've seen or what they know. How much does that still remain a, a, an issue? The, the no snitch policy is pretty much what I see is really an undefined term because, you know, for the community, that, that shouldn't even be something in their mind because information that they give to us can always be anonymous. So the no snitching thing becomes, you know, just problematic when you're talking to members of gangs and groups. But the community should not even think about that they're being a snitch when they're giving us information because, again, it's a. It, it can be an odd, but don't you think that fear exists? That uh... again, it does. Yeah. But just want to let everyone know that everything that you give us, any information that's provided to the police department, can be on an anonymous basis. Yeah. And we, we would never give up any information in regards to who gave us if you didn't give it to us anonymous. Because, again, the fear is that retali retaliation might happen to them or their loved ones. And, again, our main focus is, especially when people give us the information, is to keep yeah. the community safe. Yeah. So they don't have to fear that, oh, because I told someone, they're going to find out. Because yeah. that's not the case. It's fascinating. I, I don't envy the position you guys are in trying to sort this out every single day, but I really appreciate you coming in to talk about it. Thanks very much. And Thanks. Hopefully Thanks. Citizens will be uh, feel empowered to help for the very reasons you just suggested. Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, we come back. We're going to talk about uh, a very worrisome new study on freshwater fish. Not great news in a place like Michigan. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Nice to be able to call and get quick response. As it benefited to me and my family, I recommend to everyone, it's available 24-7. They really do care about your well-being. Hi, I'm Rachel Stewart, president of Gardner White. There are more reasons why Gardner White is your number one furniture store, more designer brands, more bestsellers, and all the latest trends for every budget. In stack and ready with free same-day delivery, more styles with free custom orders. We have more for every room in your home with the lowest prices and the lowest payments, period. If you want style and want more, come see why Gardner White is Detroit's number one furniture and mattress store. 
You can now watch your favorite local news and entertainment programming live or on demand without cable TV or an antenna with Local 4 Plus. Available now on most smart TVs, streaming devices, and on ClickOnDetroit.com. Sponsored by the University of Detroit Mercy. that health care is at my fingertips at any time. I don't have to take time off from school. I recommend to everyone. As a student of WCCCD, this is a great benefit to have. It works on your schedule. Expect more from your morning. Get up and go with Local 4 News. When you wake up, it's time to gear up for the day. What to wear, what to bring, and the best time to get outside. You need a forecast that prepares you for everything. With forewarned weather, we alert you to issues days in advance. Ice or snow, ExactTrack 4D is tracking dangerous conditions right down to your street. Whether the weather is good or bad, we'll make sure you're ready to tackle the day. Everything you need to get up and go from 4.30 to 8. Well, we have talked about PFAS quite a bit on this program. Those are the substances known as forever chemicals. They're byproducts of things like Teflon and Gore-Tex, and we know they're all over the place in Michigan, including in the water. And after a study released last week, they are quite prominently in our freshwater fish supply. Let's talk about it with Tasha Stoiber. She is the senior scientist of the Environmental Working Group, which conducted the study. Tasha, I really uh, appreciate your time. This study uh, landed with a very loud thud in a state that calls itself the Great Lakes State, so much water, so many people who fish, and many people who rely on that fish for food. Uh, were you shocked at how bad the levels were? I was, I was shocked, but at the same time not shocked. So what the study found was that um, the study that was published just this week, we looked at EPA's monitoring data of streams and rivers throughout the United States, as well as the Great Lakes, and there was widespread contamination. Um, all but 500 samples, composite samples of fish, had detectable levels of PFAS. Um, so it was shocking to see this widespread contamination and even um, high levels of, of contamination in areas um, that are uh, that are that are quite remote as well. Yeah. But urban areas did tend to have higher levels of contamination. And the Great Lakes also had higher levels of contamination comparatively. I, I'm curious about one thing. We, we, we've talked about this before on the program, whether or not Michigan has a bigger PFAS problem than, than most other states, or whether we just have more robust testing that shows that we have a bigger problem and other people are not paying as much attention as we are. Do you have a, a thought on that? I do. Michigan compared to other states has conducted more testing. They have identified more contaminated sites and have done more drinking water testing mm. um, compared to other states and, and, and even taken more proactive steps in trying to reduce industrial um, discharges to wastewater treatment plants. So the state is, um, I think, um, been proactive, um, but of course a lot more can be done at the federal level overall to, to, to try to tackle the problem. Yeah, we are still trying to sort out exactly what uh, are the many health problems are that PFAS uh, can create or lead to. Uh, but I guess the question becomes, what is your advice for people who uh, do rely? I mean, a lot of people, of course, are catch and release uh, fishermen. Uh, but what, what's your advice for people who do rely on it for food? A lot of people in Detroit do that. And this, this is really a difficult problem because it's one that can't be solved on the individual level. Um, this, is, this is a problem that does need to be tackled um, by top-down federal regulations. Um, and I think the best thing for individuals to do is just to be aware of the problem um, and to know that this can be a significant source of PFAS to your body. And I think that that, that public awareness and that public concern will help push for more stronger actions, stronger regulations that are needed to really turn off the tap on this on this pollution. Well, even many more than we have people who fish, we have people who uh, travel to the places up north, travel to places where there are things like walleye and whitefish and perch on the menu. Uh, what about those of us who are just eating this stuff in restaurants? 
So the data were compared to um, another data set of, of fish, um, another monitoring data set that was collected by the FDA. And so compared to freshwater fish, um, the FDA collected samples from grocery stores um, and other um, sources of um, you know, marine fish or fish that might be um, um, produced as farm raised. And comparatively, what is purchased in grocery stores, it was much lower compared to the freshwater caught samples. Um, so, um, so comparatively, you know, depending on the source of where you're purchasing seafood or fish, um, grocery store caught fish was much lower. Um, so, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's at least a little, that's, that's a little. So that is, that is encouraging. Yeah, it is. One of the other things, though, that was really interesting was the finding that eating one uh, PFAS filled fish uh, is the equivalent of drinking contaminated water for a month. How does that calculate? Is it just that much more densely packed into the flesh of a fish? Right, so we made those calculations to make that comparison that even infrequent, infrequent consumption of fish could result in this high level of exposure. And that we, we do pay a lot of attention to exposure from drinking water, um, but we also need to pay attention to dietary sources, especially freshwater fish that can have, um, that can be these high level significant exposures to PFAS. Yeah, and, and lastly, uh, alluding to what, what you said earlier, uh, kind of comparing it to the Great Lakes versus, say, inland uh, water sources, the problem seems to be worse in, say, a pond or a lake rather than something that is moving as the Great Lakes do. Is that, am I reading that right? So the Great Lakes levels did tend to be higher, and this could be because there's longer retention times of water. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are legacy chemicals, so these have been building up for decades. So that could explain why the levels were or did tend to be higher um, in the Great Lakes fish. Do you have much hope for us solving the PFAS problem at a federal level? There is some encouraging news in that if um, looking at earlier data sets that compared um, earlier monitoring data, there was um, about a 30% lower level of PFAS in the later data set. So it is encouraging that this could be a declining trend, mm. but absolutely what's needed is more current data yeah. to be able to yeah. understand that. Um, and it shows that actions can work. Well, we thank you so much for helping dig into your data uh, that you uh, compiled and released this past week. Tasha Story with the Environmental Working Group, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. When we come back, we'll talk with Brian Dickerson about big changes in Detroit journalism. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Save during the leather liquidation at Gorman's three-day clearance center. Everything leather is on sale at 40 to 70% off, ready for immediate delivery. Now at Gorman's three-day clearance center this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We were just spinning. We just didn't know what was going to happen next. At Samasco Law, we deal with these issues every day, especially elder law. Pat went to work for Fran. Patrick was there holding my hand, kept saying, we'll get through this, we'll get through this. He got her husband Medicaid and in a nursing home. Samasco Law got the success they deserved. Samasco Law is definitely family to me. I really appreciate knowing all of you. He's a Motor City Cruise player with big dreams. And why does it mean so much to you? It's who I am. You know, it's, it's what I've done my entire life and it's what I believe in. Taking a unique path to get to the next level. You could be the first to do something that no one's ever done. That would be a dream come true. What's he trying to do? He's trying to make NBA history. Find out what makes Ryan Terrell's goal so special and how he's using it to inspire others. Shooting for History, Monday at 545 on Local 4 News and streaming on Local 4 Plus. This weekend, save 50% off all Bernhardt at Gorman's. Save on the world-famous designs from style leader Bernhardt. This is a one-time opportunity for factory-authorized discounts of 50% off Bernhardt. Only at Gorman's. Think as if it were you on the other side. 
If I see something good around the country, we're adopting it. It's, it's hard. We are really, really close to a tipping point. That is astronomically insane. Solutionaries, the creative thinkers and doers working to make the world a better place. Subscribe at youtube.com slash solutionaries. Another big sweeping change on the Detroit journalism landscape. A number of news veterans are leaving the Detroit Free Press in what are being described as voluntary layoffs. They're voluntary because it means people like Brian Dickerson are stepping down so that forced layoffs don't happen elsewhere in the newsroom. He, of course, has been the editorial page editor of the Free, a frequent guest of mine on this program. Brian, I really appreciate you coming. I know that uh, when a couple of uh, veteran reporters get together to talk about the state of journalism, we can sound just like grumpy old men. Um, but I, I, I always worry about uh, the future of papers. For somebody who works in television, I just have always believed we're much better. We all fill our lanes and create, you know, very different spaces for people. But uh, give me your take on what's going on right now? Well, it's, it's a very tough time, not just for newspapers and magazines, but for anybody who makes their money selling advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, just this week, Microsoft, uh, Vox, uh, somebody, uh, somebody else today, Facebook, uh, Google, Google yeah. laid off 10,000 people yep. this week. Um, so it's it's endemic to the industry, um, and uh, it, it hurts because we had such a successful pandemic. A, a lot of us really supplemented our staffs and uh, right, right. provided a vital service during that time. And now it's, I right. guess we're right-sizing again out of that, but uh, we probably could have easily had Peter Batia on, the, uh, the, the, your former boss, who led the way. He hired all those people, and then when it was time to right-size, rather than letting them go, well, why don't you, you should describe what happened at the free. Uh, P Peter has been here for about five years, and uh, he's a, a quiet man, and a lot of people in the community don't know him, but he has completely transformed the Free Press newsroom. The pandemic, obviously a very difficult time to put out a newspaper, but he saw that there was also an opportunity, a, a captive audience of people starved for information about their health, about their government. Yep. And he hired about 20, 25 people uh, on the Free Press staff, terrific people, uh, largely women and people of color, all of them have skills that people of my generation will never have. And when uh, the edict came down from our parent company to cut a lot of money out of the newsroom budget. A lot of money. Peter did what he's always done in, in my experience with him. He led by example and he laid himself off rather than, uh, you, you know, sweep aside what he considers his legacy, the staff he'd built that looks so much more like the community we cover than any any staff that the free press has ever put together um and it, he he never asked anybody else to do the same thing but it was really easy to follow his example um it, it, he also gave uh, birth to a phrase that i have come to love that in journalism we are try to, trying to fight truth decay I love that. I'll be forever grateful for that. The other, but, but, but while we pour water on this current fire, long term, um, you have to be as worried as I am about uh, how this is all going to play out because I know you believe like I do. A, a free press is, uh, is not just a business. It's a, it's a part of a functioning democracy. Terribly vital. It, it absolutely is. And I'm, I'm not quite as pessimistic as I was uh, a year or two ago. Really? We've, well, this is we've, good. we've come through some tough times. This was a very scary election mm -hmm. in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of people seem to have understood what's at stake and, and elected, I think, some of, some of the most promising leaders I've seen in my uh, 35 years in, in Michigan. Well, maybe more importantly, we did not have what I was afraid we were going to have, which was a big fight over the results and people banging on the windows again uh, over at, at Huntington Place. It all seemed to, it went a little more smoothly than, than I, I think I expected. But how is it that Detroit is still a town that has two newspapers? That's astonishing. 
Well, when you have a joint it, operating agreement, is yes, part of it. Yes, that, that is part of it. Part of it is that we uh, we have a contract that mandates that we have two newspapers uh, for for a while longer. Uh, this has always been a town where we had what we in the industry call great penetration. Lots of households taking the newspaper. Uh, today, many fewer of them read it in print. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that happened during the pandemic was that we doubled our paid digital subscriptions and then doubled it again. And that c number continues to rise almost every week. Um, That's hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. so. What are you going to do now? Uh, you've, you were someone with a with a, uh, a, a, an insightful mind and a very supple sense of humor, so you're always welcome on Flashpoint, of course, uh, those being two of the, <laughs> the leading requirements of the job. But what that, are you going to do now? I don't expect you to just sort of uh, kick up your feet. I'm, I'm going to follow the news a little less assiduously for, <laughs> for a few weeks at least. I'm not buying that, and, but okay. And uh, rest and uh, exercise more than I have. And uh, at some point, I'm just going to sit down with uh, a bunch of smart people that I admire and ask them how they think uh, a 66-year-old guy with my <laughs> peculiar skills and weaknesses can be most useful going forward. It's a, it's a, it's a great skill set, and I, I trust you'll find a way to use it. Brian, thanks so much for all of the times that you've been on this program, but especially today. It's been a privilege. You bet. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the Press is coming up next. Hope you have a great week, and we will see you next time right back here at Flashpoint.